Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters, and very welcome guests. Those of us that make our living in the public sector really look forward to being able to speak before a Toastmasters group. I found, more than the regulated community, that Toastmasters are generally supportive and unforgiving. <laughs> Actually, they're more forgiving than the regulated community. Joanne and I have really been looking forward to this trip. As you know, the legislature has left Helena, and Helena has promptly froze over, so we drove out of a snowstorm yesterday. It was a blizzard condition on McDonald Pass. But as we drove through Missoula, it was as clear as Missoula gets. <laughs> <laughs> but as we got to the Mission Valley, the sun broke through, the mountain peaks were crystal and white, and it was just wonderful, and we knew we were in for a very good time. But I have to admit, I was a little bit concerned as we got to the motel. As we were coming in to check in and do our registration, there was a group of fairly boisterous people in the hallway. And they were being very vocal, and I thought, wow, these must be Toastmasters. But I didn't recognize any of them. So I was listening a little bit to what they were having to say, and they were talking about that brilliant move, Knight over Queen, something like that. They were having this chess jargon going on. And I happened to notice out of the corner of my eye, the manager was standing at the registration desk. And he wasn't looking real happy. He was kind of perturbed, kind of grumpy. So I went over and told him who I was and was filling out the registration card. And as I was trying to remember our license plate number, the manager said, that's it. They've been at that for over an hour. He goes over and he talks to this group of people. And he says, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And they were aghast. They were looking at him. I thought, wow, you know, I'm glad they're not Toastmasters. And so he tells them to leave, and they politely leave. And he comes back to the counter, and you know, I'm filling this out. And I say, well, you know, what was up with that? And he says, you know, I can't stand chestnuts boasting in an open foyer. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Wilson, have the judges been briefed as to the rules? Mark, have the contestants been briefed? Yes, sir, they have. Carolyn Chalsey. Carolyn Chalsey. <laughs> the word for the day is itinerant, which means traveling from place to place. Example is, we must have itinerant area governors in order to provide coverage for the area clubs. The table topic today is what can District 17 do to enhance the Toastmaster experience for each member in the district? I'll repeat. What can District 17 do to enhance the Toastmaster experience for each member in the district? Again, the word of the day is itinerant. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters, and very welcome guests. What could District 17 do to enhance the experience for each and every one of us? I think we should all become itinerants. I think we should travel around the state, spend our time a little bit with each club. In the few years that I've been part of Toastmasters, I've found that visiting other clubs has been very enriching to me. Every club develops its own personality. Each and every club develops its own culture. In our club, for example, one of the things we emphasize are gestures. Now, we have gender-oriented gestures. The guys do a lot of this kind of stuff. And the women do a little bit gentler sort of thing. In fact, some of us get the fig leaf sort of posture going quite often. But I'd like to know what you do in your club, or what you do in your club. How is it different in Anaconda than it is in Helena? God forbid, we know it's got to be different in Anaconda than it is in Helena. <laughs> I think it would just be a delightful experience, though, to visit every club in this state, because I think we learn so much from each other that it's got to be 
the most enriching experience because standing before you a bunch of wonderful supportive Toastmasters is one of the better experiences of my life and I hope that we all get a chance to meet each other over this weekend and in the future. Nancy Jeffery, Nancy Jeffery. Mr. Topic Presenter, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, it is my pleasure to be here today at my first district conference. I am surprised and delighted with the amount of energy, enthusiasm, expertise that I've gained. Presentations today were superb. I think I learned a lot to be able to bring back. I think part of what I am hoping to learn today is to bring back some tips for our club because I think really what the district can do is to be a place to disperse ideas, to disperse different ways of looking at events, looking at speaking, looking at leadership to the club level. Because frankly, we get involved in our clubs and what we end up doing is seeing the same people time and time again. We get the same ideas time and time again. The district offers us an opportunity to explore new ways of looking at things. The other suggestion which I got today, I think just from the presentation, was to have a chance to share among clubs some great ideas. The orientation packs that we had talked about today, new member packs, I think those are wonderful. I think really the strength of each individual club is part of the responsibility of the district. So I am hoping that we can continue to foster that relationship. Mr. Topic Presenter. Sharon Solom. Sharon Solom. That is a great question because I thought of exactly this thing this morning while I was talking with Bruce Trippett. He bounded into the room this morning for breakfast. The rest of us were searching for coffee. Bruce is ready to go and he doesn't even drink coffee. <laughs> what I want us to do is bring Bruce Trippett back to Montana, have him be a member of my club or at least <laughs> District 17 and I think that will do a lot for us because we already are a pretty fun group. I have been to a lot of these conventions and, and just had a great time. I've made great many friends. And I think that the fun level is about here. Adding Bruce would bring it up here. <laughs> Bruce already travels a lot for Toastmasters. He's a very itinerant Toastmaster. And I think that he wouldn't mind being the district governor here. Montana is a huge state. It would be not a problem for Bruce. He would just be going here and there and here and there at 500 miles an hour, no matter where he went or when he went. I think that's what we need is to have some more high energy in Toastmaster. And Bruce would be a great mentor. And that is a program that I really advocate for us all too. So think it over, Bruce, if you kind of could just think about it a little bit. We would appreciate you coming back to District 17. Julene Lesoto. Julene Lesoto. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Hello, Toastmasters, and welcome guests. Toastmasters, to me, was an opportunity to open up like a rose. I knew I had some potential, but I was all closed up. And the ingredient, I believe, that really gave me the opportunity to blossom was joy. And I think District 17 needs to spread that. There, ha there has to be an overcoming of the fear. And what better than with joy? You can't have both. You can't be in the same space. You can't have fear and have joy at the same time. So maybe our leaders who travel around, they're our children. They're going from group to group. They could bring that element of joy along with them. As an example, examples are what teach, teach us. So if the officer is coming in and bringing that joy, which I'm seeing this weekend, it's just absolute abundance. I've been, I've been laughing since I've gotten here. And I think that's great because humor makes us sharp, opens our hearts, allows us the opportunity to teach and to receive and to touch one another. So I think the best way for Area 17 to improve each and every one of us as individuals is through that little bit of element of joy. 
Jeff Ammerman. Jeff Ammerman. Mr. Topic Master, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests. It's obviously very important to be itinerant in your district leadership. We need to have leaders that can travel from club to club and report on the activities at the higher levels among various other clubs and to share these club Toastmaster experience. To bring stories, perhaps testimonies from club to club. For instance, my own Toastmaster testimony would go something like this. I was relating earlier with my lunch table here. When I was first a Toastmaster, before I became a Toastmaster, I was an extremely phobic speaker. As a matter of fact, if I was having to get up and speak in front of a crowd of this size, my voice would shake, my hands would go ice cold, my heart would race, my mind, I couldn't even think straight. I wouldn't know what I was even saying. And people would tell me, that, you know, I don't know this guy. You seem to have humor. You seem to do okay. But to me, that wasn't enough because it wasn't going to be any good when they put that on my tombstone. Here lies a man who didn't look like he was afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so testimonies like this that we touched on earlier in Bruce's presentation this morning are very important. And if you're not in it, you will not get this out across this message from club to club. Testimonies, I think, are one of the most valuable ways to encourage new members and to keep clubs going, to keep club membership. And so I just think that it's very, very important that we have time to get together with the top members that they're getting out to these clubs in, in District 17, that we're sharing our experiences. Postmasters is a wonderful experience. I don't really have any fear right now as I speak that I'm going to drop dead at any moment of fright. This is a good thing. And so if I can do it, anyone can do it. And I think that Toastmasters has something for everyone and that we need to bring these shared experiences together so that we can all be encouraged and so that we can get the word out on Toastmasters. It's a wonderful program. This is a wonderful district. And I'm glad to be a part of it. And I hope all of you are glad to be a part of it also. Mr. Topic. Well, it's always amazing me at this level of competition. And actually, the area and club, the level of courage and stamina the contestants have. And when we get to this area and beyond, it just teaches us all how much we can grow and learn through the Toastmasters organization. I admire each of our contestants today. You ready to go? Yes. We're, going, we're going to the speaking bee in the Mountain View room. Oh, you want to know who won? Oh, oh, God, how could I leave that out? All right, third place for District 17 Table Topics con Competition, Juline Lasota. <laughs> Congratulations, Juline, nice job. Second place. District 17, table, tipic, table topics <laughs> competition. Nancy Jevry. <laughs> and the winner, the suspense is killing me, the winner of our table topics competition, <laughs> who knows exactly how to time himself, Jeff Amerman. <laughs> Congratulations. Yours and this is yours. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. job, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for being here. For without an audience, it's very hard to be a speaker. <laughs> we appreciate your participation at your level today, and I hope you can continue to enjoy the activities of this afternoon and this evening. We are adjourned to the Speaking Bee in the Mountain View Room, a 15-minute hike. There's a, there's a latrine stop in between here and there if you need one of those. And Jim Oliveras would like the contestants to, for the speaking bee, the, the people who are participating in the speaking bee, to please meet with him immediately. Thank you all.
speaker tonight, Samuel Richter. Receiving love. Receiving love. Samuel Richter. If you have enough love, you can be the most powerful and happiest person in the world. This is a quote from the famous metaphysical author, Dr. Emmett Fox. The absence of love is the most frightening thing that can happen to a human being. I say to you tonight that the human instinct is to have a happy relationship. The human instinct is to have love. Tonight I'm going to contrast two types of individuals who seek love. The first one is one who I call a taker. A taker is one that is, wants something but is, does not want to give anything back. A taker is characterized by, for example, hogging the conversation. A taker is characterized by, in their conversation, saying a lot of I's and me's and talking about themselves. The second type of person is called a giver. A giver seeks love by giving. They expect to receive love back by actually giving something. Now, I thought about this for a minute, and I analyzed myself, and how do I go about doing this? How can I get love by giving? And I thought for a minute, and, and during my thoughts, I thought about my grandparents. And I thought about those people in the old folks' homes. The people, you go in there, and you see in their eyes that they're missing something. Some of them have nobody. Some of them think that they have been forgotten. Some of them never have visitors. And there's a, there's a certain emptiness in there. And I suggest this. I suggest that in order to receive love and to, to give love is, is go into one of these old folks' homes and maybe, maybe adopt one of them and, and share things with them. And yes, yes, even, even hug them. And I tell you what, you do that, you do that and you will see a gleam in their eyes, a reason for living, you will see tears of joy come down their cheeks. Another part that, uh, of giving that I always like because of my, my occupation, and that is a, a team. A team. A team gets together before they go out in competition. They get together. They go, team! and then they go out and compete. That is a really special love because every day they're practicing, they're giving to each other. And in competition, they're giving to each other. And that type of love, if they love each other, they are truly a team. They are something greater than themselves. There's a story that, that is really dear to me. Ever since I heard it over uh, and saw it, on a 2020 program, and it concerns giving. It's a story about a lady named Linda Bristol. She was a teacher, an outstanding teacher. She, uh, she developed a, a tumor, a cancerous tumor in her brain. And the doctor gave her six months to live. And she thought to herself, well, if I only have six months to live, I'm going to do what I love to do best, which is create. So she painted, and her paintings were so good, they were, they were sold at galleries. Her, she, uh, she wrote poetry, which was published. And just before she died, she, she decided to donate her organs to others, give her organs to others so they, they can use them possibly. And it just so happened her eyes got sent to an eye bank in New Jersey. And her eyes were received by 
a young man. The young man was able to see because of her eyes. This young man was so grateful, he contacted the eye bank to find out who the parents of these eyes, of Linda's eyes, so he could go and, and thank them. And he found the parents in Staten Island. He came to their house unannounced. The parents hugged him because they were grateful that their daughter could actually help someone. And they offered that he stay there for a while. He stayed there. He started looking around and noticing that a lot of the things that he liked, that Linda liked also. Like, for example, reading Plato. And he read Plato in Braille. And during a special time, a moment, the mother started looking at him. And, and she said, you look familiar. I've seen you somewhere before. Then it hit her. She ran upstairs to Linda's room. And the last painting that she did, she brought it down. It was a portrait. It was a portrait of that young man. And right below that portrait was a poem that went like this. Two hearts passing in the night, falling, falling in love, not able to see each other's sight. I say to you tonight, if you, if you really want to receive love, you've got to receive love by giving it. Thank you. Our next contestant, Carl Berkelow, a friend, a friend, Carl Berkelow. Out of a Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and most welcome guests. I think the thing that I have enjoyed most about Toastmasters is meeting new friends. And after all, friends are just about the most important thing we have personally as we go through life. And real friends are friends that like us not because of what we possess, but because of who we are. And they welcome any opportunity they have to indicate that they like us. And they want, in return for that, nothing but our friendship. I would like to tell you about a very special friend of mine. He's not a member of Toastmasters. In fact, he is unable to speak. Now, even though he is unable to articulate intelligible sounds, he can indicate his mood, suggesting whether he is happy or sad or energetic or tired. And he's, most of the times, he's very vigorous and animated. He's always happy to see me, it seems. And I've thought that if I should be so afflicted, I believe I would feel resentful. But my friend shows no evidence of feeling sorry for himself because of this limitation. And just as beauty is said to be in the eye of the beholder, it appears to me that the impact of an affliction must depend upon the perception of the person that is so afflicted. Now, as if this one limitation were not enough, my friend has no hands. Absence of fingers and an opposable thumb severely limits one's ability to pick up things or to perform any fine movements. So he's unable to pound with a hammer, to use a screwdriver, or to brush his own teeth. But again, he doesn't seem to feel that fate has dealt him a very serious and severe blow by giving him this affliction. Now thus far I've mentioned only problems that my friend has. He actually has some very positive attributes. He's the most 
happy fellow with any kind of a gift, however small, just this little thing would make him extremely happy. I guess I haven't mentioned to you that he has four legs and a tail. <laughs> he has a wonderful sense of balance and he can run 20 miles an hour for short periods of time. His name is Jake and he's a four-year-old golden retriever. But somehow the picture that I have in my mind of Jake as this brilliant dog is kind of shattered when I see him going around in circles chasing his tail. <laughs> now, I suppose having Jake for a friend is like having another child in the family. We have to make arrangements for his care if we plan to go away. His pediatrician is actually a veterinarian <laughs> whom he sees annually for his routine checkup and his shots. Jake's motivation in life seems to be twofold. On the one hand, to be part of the action, and on the other hand, to show affection. He's uh, about this high, he weighs 88 pounds, so he's admirably built to sniff out newcomers front and back. <laughs> and I think that actually, very understandably, he wants to know to whom he's going to show affection. I've never seen Jake demonstrate any meanness. He does have a vigorously wagging tail that can knock a, a small child down like they were hit from behind with a linebacker. <laughs> but at the same moment, the front part of his body is showering affection on somebody else. My grandchildren can step on his ears or step on his tail, and he never complains. The kids love him. Jake is actually an ambassador of goodwill. When I take him out walking on a leash, people sometimes stop me, and they ask if it's all right to pet the dog. And I've met some very interesting people this way. He has a wonderful way of breaking the ice socially. <laughs> Women and children particularly seem to be drawn to Jake. And it occurred to me, if I had thought about this when I were a young man, I'd have stumbled upon a wonderful way to meet lots of women. <laughs> I don't know if I would have known what to do after the ice were broken, but I think I'd have had a much more memorable past. I can remember times when people have not been too pleased with me and they've treated me harshly. And you know, it's nice after I've been barked at by a human to be smiled at by my dog. <laughs> now he can smile. And I suppose that I should be ashamed to admit that I like Jake better than some humans that I know. <laughs> but that's the way I feel. I don't know how it is at your house, but I want to assure you that every time I come home, my wife is not standing there wagging her tail with her tongue hanging out. <laughs> but Jake is always happy to see me. He never seems to display any bad feeling about having had a bad day. He's always in good, a good mood. You know, our world today is torn by hatred and violence. And it has occurred to me that friendship is a wonderful antidote for hatred. And Jake has reminded me many times of the value of approaching people with sincere friendliness. No matter what my mood, when I present myself to him, he accepts me in good grace. Now, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that what friendship and Toastmasters is all about. Madam Toastmaster. Our third speaker, Rich Briner. Do the thing you fear to do. Do the thing you fear to do, <coughs> Rich Briner. I'm 12 years old and I'm standing in line at the high diving board at Lakewood Park Outdoor Swimming Pool. I got goosebumps. My palms are sweaty. 
My knees are knocking. My heart is pounding. What am I doing here? My brother Mickey is a head shorter than me and two years younger than me. And he can dive off of that diving board. And me, Richie, his older brother, the wimp, can't do it. But today's the day I'm going to show him. It's my turn. I grab that cold steel and I start to climb and it feels like a beanstalk going up to the sky. And I'm up there and boy is it high up there. I edge my way out that diving board. I get halfway out when suddenly I realize the railing only goes halfway. <laughs> I'm going to have to go the rest of the way unaided. That diving board is this wide, but at that moment, for me, it felt like a two by four. I tight roped out that two by four. I curled my toes over the edge and I jumped. I'm in the water. I'm okay. Wait till Mickey hears about this. Exhilaration lies on the other side of fear. Fellow Toastmasters and guests, what is it for you and me? Is it fear of public speaking? Maybe not. Fear of asserting yourself? Fear of changing jobs or careers? Maybe it's fear of being alone or fear of aging or maybe it's fear of ending a relationship or, or losing a loved one or maybe it's fear of being out in front of this lectern with no notes or fear of wearing red socks in public. <laughs> Susan Jeffers in her book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, says that there is an epidemic of fear in this country. We fear beginnings, we fear endings, we fear life, we fear death, we fear success, we fear failure. What does she say to do about it? She says that we should treat fear as a fact of life, not as an obstacle to our goals. In other words, she says that we should feel the fear and do it anyway. Easy for her to say. She wasn't there. February 1970, I was a college student at Kulas Auditorium on the John Carroll University campus. I was sitting in the front row that night, so close to the stage I could touch it. There were 400 people behind me packed into that auditorium. We were four miles from polluted Lake Erie. Who was the speaker? Ralph Nader, consumer advocate. Ralph Nader had been speaking for 20 minutes, and I hadn't heard one word that he said. Why? Because Ralph Nader was losing his voice right before my ears. I was the closest person to him. He was speaking and he was losing his voice. And I was looking up on the lectern. There was no water. There was no one on stage to help Ralph Nader out. But I wasn't going to help him. <laughs> Why? Because I'd have to go to the aisle, turn and face 800 eyeballs and go back. Well, I wasn't going to do it. Well, Ralph kept speaking. Nobody was helping him. His voice was getting worse. So I got up, I went to the aisle, I faced those 800 eyeballs, I went to the lobby, I looked around, I found a, a, a Dixie cup, I rinsed it out, <laughs> and I carried that Dixie cup ever so carefully all the way to the front of the stage. I took two steps to the right, and I took four steps up on stage. I was on stage with Ralph Nader, and as I turned to walk across that stage, I could feel eight hundred eyeballs. <laughs> At that moment, I said to myself, don't trip now, Briner. <laughs> I walked across that stage and I set that glass of water right on that lectern. Ralph Nader didn't bat an eyelash, didn't even acknowledge my presence. I went and I sat back down in my seat and once again, Ralph Nader spoke for 20 more minutes. And I didn't hear one word he said. What was I thinking? I was thinking, 
Pick up the glass, Ralph. Drink the water, Ralph. And I was thinking that my friends were thinking, look at that turkey grinder up on stage with Ralph Nader. What a hot dog he is. And look it, Ralph isn't even drinking the water. Grinder, <laughs> what a hot dog, what a turkey. That's what I was thinking that they were thinking. Well, the speech ended. And Ralph Nader said, any questions? I wanted to ask him why he didn't drink the water. <laughs> but I wasn't going to raise my hand in front of all these people. But then I thought, wait a minute, Briner. You've already been on stage with this dude. You've almost done a soft shoe up there. How tough can it be to raise your hand? So I did. He called on me first. I was so close. Pointed right at me. I stood up and I said, Mr. Nader, I'm the guy who gave you the glass of water and I was wondering if the reason you didn't drink it is because it came from Lake Erie. <laughs> all of a sudden, all around, people started laughing. Somebody started applauding. Everybody started applauding. The place was applauding, not Ralph Nader. They were applauding my question, the one that I almost never asked. Rollo May says, every encounter is an act of courage. But Ralph Waldo Emerson says it the best. Do the thing you fear to do. And the death of fear is certain. Mr. Toastman. <clears throat> Our fourth contestant is Carolyn Sho Shosi. <laughs> Close, not quite. <laughs> a place where no birds sang. A place where no birds sang. Carolyn Shosi. <clears throat> Hello, Toastmasters, and very welcome guests. It was one of those crisp autumn afternoons when the air had the snap of a freshly picked Jonathan apple, when the leaves crunched under your feet, orange and red and yellow. And the birds, oh, the birds were just filling the air with their song, chirping and chattering, packing up, getting ready to head south for the winter. We'd lived in Germany for about a year then. And I'd been pregnant most of that time, but our little son was three months old. We decided that was the day to get out for an adventure because it was a day when everything was good and right. So we put him in the car and drove 30 miles or so down the road to Bergen-Belsen, one of the lesser known concentration camps of World War II. I had had a real morbid curiosity about what this place might be like I assumed there'd be concertina wire and broken hulks of guard towers looming over the top of it. But when we got there, it wasn't like that at all. Instead, there was a fenced enclosure the size of a couple of football fields, rolling green lawns off into the distance. And this expanse of green was broken by only two structures. Near the parking lot, was a one-story brick building, and halfway across those lawns was a white obelisk that pierced that crystal blue sky. I pushed my son's buggy into that building near the entrance, and there I saw what I had anticipated. Photographs covered the walls, pictures of bodies, people with sunken cheeks and hollow eyes, arms grasping through the fence, reaching for freedom. I read what it was like when those Allied soldiers arrived there, April 15, 1945. How the stench was overwhelming. How their grief was unbearable because the bodies and souls were so far broken that even the most valiant efforts couldn't save them. After the assault of those pictures, I pushed my son's buggy back outside for a breath of air. 
and he began to cry. No, he didn't begin to cry. He began to scream, and I picked him up, and no amount of cradling and cajoling could stop his infant agony. A friend who had come with us offered to take him back to the car, and as she crossed into the parking lot, the crying stopped. So she turned and started to come back to join us, but the minute she crossed that portal into the concentration camp, the screaming began again. What was it that this tiny child could sense? Are there some places so evil that even an infant knows it? With a resigned wave, she turned and went back to the car, and I started off across that obelisk in the middle of this field. Toward the top of it was a star of David, and under, in Hebrew, were written the words, Earth shall not forget what happened here. What happened here was the slaughter of 30,000 people, Jews, Poles, Slavs, Gypsies, men, women, children, babies like mine. As I stopped to let this thought sink in, I realized that those rolling green lawns that I had thought were so beautifully manicured when I first entered were not what I had thought. These were mass graves. I was standing in the middle of mass graves. Here the Nazis had dug huge trenches and thrown the bodies of those people they had killed and taken bulldozers and shoved the dirt to hide their guilt. And here too is where those allied soldiers had placed those broken bodies that they found when they arrived, and those who died when they tried to save them. Because for them, this was a public health disaster. There was typhus and tuberculosis. If they didn't cover these bodies, they too could perish in this awful place. I also realized as I stood there how deathly quiet it was. Few others had come that day as we had and they too were silent. And I listened for my son's cries, but I didn't hear them. What was it he had sent inside that place? But where were the birds? The birds that were singing so cheerfully at my home, only a few miles down the road. Where were they? To be sure, within that fenced enclosure, there were no trees. I'm sure they had been cut down long, long ago. Perhaps they might have given some solace or respite to someone who might have sought freedom. Or perhaps they were cut down to provide firewood to heat the quarters of Joseph Kramer, the beast of Belson, the commandant of the camp. Surely they wouldn't want him to die, freezing and starving like the others there. But beyond those fences was a forest. There should have been birds. There should have been singing. But there was only silence. Perhaps as my tiny son had sensed in some place so ancient and so spiritual that we cannot know on this earthly level, this was an evil place. This was a dead place. This was a place where no birds sang. Okay, so. Our fifth speaker, Dorothy LaDuke. Carpe diem, seize the day. Dorothy LaDuke. Carpe diem, seize the day. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. Carpe diem, seize the day. Live each moment to the fullest. He was born April 27th. 1960. He was a cute little fellow, not much hair, ears a little too big for the rest of him, but he soon grew into them. It was obvious from the start, this was a child in a hurry. He had places to go, people to meet, and things to do. He hardly took the time to learn to crawl. It seems he just stood up and started to walk and then to run, and he never stopped, and he never looked back. 
When he was only about 16 months old, the mother put him out in the backyard to play. There was a picket fence about so high across the back of the property, a wire fence down both sides. He would climb up that wire fence, sit on the picket with his diaper, fling his leg over and down the other side and away he'd go free, teaching the older siblings how to get out of the yard as well. In 1962, the family moved from Michigan to Riverton, Wyoming, where the child would grow up. He was precocious to say the least. One fine summer day, the mother was rounding up the kids to come in for lunch. No Paul. Did not answer when called. The mother was quite concerned. She even jumped in the car, drove up and down the neighborhood streets. No sign of this four-year-old child came home quite concerned and anxious, wondering, what shall I do next? When she walked in the front door, there he was at the kitchen table making his own peanut butter sandwich. He took one look at the mother's face, and he made a beeline for that back door and the mother after him. <laughs> when she caught him, she tied him up to the clothesline pole in the backyard for safekeeping. When she looked out the kitchen window a few moments later, there he was, just so nonchalant, leaned up against that clothesline pole, not another place in the world he wanted to be. <laughs> he loved sports. He was well coordinated, very agile, quick on his feet. And as most little boys did, he played little league baseball, and he was good. The summer he was 12, the Riverton All-Stars qualified for the final game for the state championship. It turned out to be a real pitcher's battle. Last half, the seventh inning, the score was zero to zero. The Torrington pitcher finally started to tire, and he walked a Riverton batter. You guessed it. The clutch hitter was up to bat, and yes, he did. He got a hit, drove in the only run of the game. He was the hero of the hour, and Riverton won the state championship. He loved football, but he was a little guy, small in stature, and he tried. He played football in seventh and eighth grade in junior high, but he really took quite a drubbing. By the end of eighth grade, he had decided he was just too small to play football. But after football season comes wrestling, and that was his forte. He loved it. He had a coach who was also small in stature as he was, but a giant in character, and together they were an unbeatable team. The mother went to one of his high school matches, found a seat in the bleachers, getting settled in, when all at once that whole gymnasium erupted with a chant of, wog, wog, wog. And the mother wondered, what on earth are they saying? And then she smiled as she realized his friends and classmates had shortened his childhood nickname of Pollywog to simply Wog. <laughs> he won many honors and ribbons and trophies throughout his high school wrestling career. He could never quite capture the state championship, however. Paul set three goals for himself when he was in high school. He would be in the Navy, he would wrestle, and he would cook. In January of 1978, he took his pre-induction physical for the Navy, packed with flying colors. In May at graduation time, he was awarded the coveted silver tray, the outstanding student in the high school cooking department. Shortly after graduation, he left for basic training, San Diego, United States Navy. In the meantime, things were falling apart at home. The mother and father were separated and a divorce was in progress. He loved his family and he took it very hard. He came home on leave one time to find the mother practically immobile. Cigarette in one hand, cup of coffee in the other, constantly in tears. He had no time for that. No patience with her pity party. Carpe diem, mom. Life goes on. Get with it. He went back to his duties. She moved to Billings, Montana. She met, fell in love, and married a great guy. Just happened that he was on leave 
after a six weeks wrestling tour with the Navy team. So he got to spend a few days in Billings. He and the new stepfather hit it off right away and were planning a fall hunting trip. The mother saw him off at the Billings airport, handsome and smiling, as he went back to his duties aboard the USS Bryce Canyon stationed in Honolulu. About three weeks later, the mother was on her knees in the garden when she looked up and there stood three naval officers in full dress uniform. It was not necessary for them to say a word, the mother knew. She sprang to her feet like an injured deer as she ran across the garden and she cried out as King David must have cried at the news of his son, oh Absalom, Absalom, I would that it were me that was taken, but it was not. E3, Paul Kenneth Cook, United States Navy, wrestler and chef, died June 19, 1980. He was only given 20 short years, but oh, how he lived them. I miss my son, and I try each day to live up to his legacy. Perfect diem, seize the day. Madam President. Our sixth speaker, <clears throat> Elizabeth Collins. Where have my dreams all gone? Where have my dreams all gone? Elizabeth Collins. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and friends, have you ever asked yourself, where have my dreams all gone? They've sort of passed me by, just like time passed me by. Have you ever said that to yourself? You stand right here and it's the present. Behind you is yesterday and you grab out for tomorrow and you cannot touch it. Tonight I would like to tell you how you can activate your dreams Relive your dreams. Stop making excuses and go for it. One evening, I received a telephone call. Hello, hi. Hi, Mary. How are you doing? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. Yes, indeed. What's that? You're talking too fast. A little slower, please. Ron did what? Oh, Mary, that's magnificent. Yes, yes, I'll come right over to the house now. Put the coffee on. Yes, I will. Bye, Mary. And I did. Mary is my best friend. And she has a son, Ron. And you know what happened? He won a four-year scholarship to Princeton University. Now, Princeton University is one of the 10 most prestigious schools in the United States. And Ron had always said when he was that high and that high and growing up, yes, I'm going to go there. And he was accepted. Now, you ask, how did Ron accomplish this? Ron had a dream, and he took goals, and he made the goals to the step to the dreams, and he just flew with it, just flew with it. Now, goals are often hard to do, because with a goal, you have to have human labor, you have to have self-honesty, you have to have courage, and you have to have faith that you will do it. And there are certain steps that you must take to complete a goal. The first step is inspiration. And then you take action to this inspiration. And then when you take action, you have realization and an insight. Then you declare it. And after you declare it frequently, what have you got? You've got exaltation, 
joy and enthusiasm, you made your dream come true. Oh, what you say? I can't do that. I'm too old. I'm not young anymore. Let the young one do that. Is that how you feel? Fiddlesticks! Be true to yourself. There's only one of you, and you are worth it. Dreams are your very, very special gift to yourself for you to enjoy. Dreams when accomplished are those memories that are yours alone and can never be taken away from you. I have two dreams as yet undone. I am going hot air ballooning <laughs> for the first dream and the second dream I'm going sailing with a full sail into the sunset. Now, the first dream I'm going to do is hot air ballooning, right? And what I'm going to do is rise up from the earth into the world's blue yonder, up in that limitless blue sky, free as a bird will I fly, up and down and over the current with not a care or a worry of the world. I will be free. Oh, oh, what the most delicious, exciting experience it will be. And my second dream is to go sailing under a full sail, following the sun. I've never done this, but I'm going to cruise, cruise, yes, skip across the deep blue sea with the majesty of the sun to lead me. Yes, that is what I'm going to do again. And indeed, I will be free. Now, my friends, in conclusion, I say to you, roll up your sleeves. Take that step forward. Make your dream come true. Don't worry about time. Not at all. Don't worry about the time. Make a goal, a little one, a big one, but make your dream come true. Yes, stand up straight, head high, shoulders back, and say to yourself, I can do it. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And you will. Just go for it. Thank you.